So, Father, this morning, I thank you so much for what you are doing. I pray the prayer that Paul prayed for the church, that you would continue to open the eyes of our spiritual understanding and help us to comprehend what Jesus has already done for us and who we are in Christ, that he is our head, we are his body, everything of the enemy is under our feet. Jesus is the victor and we walk in his victory, Lord. We thank you for opening our eyes to comprehend that fully, not with just our mind, but with our knower, down deep in our knower, that we can continue to walk in the victory that Jesus died to give us. And Father, right now, I thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon us today and those that are watching online thank you for your anointing to be able to deliver your word and receive your word and for great fruit to come from it in Jesus name and everybody said Amen. amen and amen this morning I want to talk to you about why we exist as a church if somebody asks you that why does radiant church exist As a church, would you be able to articulate to them clearly why you come here every Sunday faithfully to participate in what God is doing in this house? I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Because Jesus is the head of the church. We are his body And he is our model. The Son of God put on humanity, came, humbled himself, laid aside his divine prerogatives, was empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a a model or example for what the people of God, the church, Jesus came to establish the church. We are his body. And he gave us a model so that we can look at the model, the Son of God, and realize this is what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to be like. Amen? For, so, for too long, the evangelical church has looked at the, the epistles of Paul and the letters in the New Testament, and we've derived our theology from Paul. Hermeneutics has taught us, well, you know what? You can't make use theo- make theology out of historical genre or historical books. So what we have done is relegated the historical books of the Gospels and Acts. This is the evangelical church. Relegated that to antiquity. And it doesn't apply to us today. So we have stripped Jesus out of our Christianity by and large. What he did was hung on the cross. We trust in him for our salvation. But all the stuff that Jesus did, largely the evangelical church says that doesn't apply to us today. Is it true? So this idea of cessationism, I've talked to you about that before. The gifts of the Spirit cease in the early church and so it's not true because it's always continued throughout church history always continued but there's a spotlight that has come on the 20th century where we have this revelation our eyes have been opened and we see and know that the gifts of the Spirit the power of the Spirit is still for us today very much for us today and it's needed today but there's still a large portion of the evangelical church that disagrees with what we believe, okay? I want to take you back to Jesus because our job is to do what Jesus came and died on the cross. He died, descended into hell, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He rose up and ascended back to the Father and he sat down and he said, my work is finished. And then he gave his work to his church to go in his name with his power and with his authority and with the keys of the kingdom to do his work. Because if you look in Revelation, 
chapter 1, verse 8, I think it is, or 18. Jesus, the glorified Jesus, is standing there and saying, Behold, I hold the keys of death and hell. So, beloved, whenever he made that statement, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That's because he knew he had the keys and he gave us the keys. So what I'm going to do this morning, oh, and I, we're going to do it real fast. Remember just about two weeks ago, I took you through Mark, boom, 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 boom. Remember that? What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to take you quickly through the book of Luke, and I'm going to quickly highlight what Jesus did. And I hope that by the end of this message, you are going to say, that's why we exist as a church. Are you ready? Whenever Jesus, his, his baptism in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit came upon him, that was Jesus' baptism in the Holy Spirit. First model, baptism of the Holy Spirit. He went out of there. The Spirit of God came up on him. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He did face-to-face -face combat with, with Satan. He said the battle was with Satan. Satan is a real foe. He's a real enemy of God. But beloved, just like that song said, he is not, his, he is not God's equal. Satan is a created being. He's a rebellious fallen archangel. And there we are not, this is not dualism. This is not God against equal partner Satan. It is God Almighty who has crushed Satan under his feet. Don't ever forget that. Yes, Satan is powerful, but Jesus Christ defeated him. Hallelujah. And Jesus, after he kicked Satan's butt in the wilderness, he came up out of the wilderness and he rolled the scroll and he read from the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is all spiritual. We're not talking about going downtown Lincoln, Nebraska and opening the prison doors of the jail cells. We're talking about those who have been taken prisoners of war. And they're locked up and they're bound up. And they're like missing in action prisoners that God came to set free. Luke 19.10 says, the most important thing, this is the most important thing, why Jesus came. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Can you say it with me? The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of Man, Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Saying the same thing. The devil has people bound. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and set people free. Whenever Jesus stood up and he read from the book of Isaiah, he's reading the emancipation of proclamation. I'm here, and this is what I've come to do. This is the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. He's saying, the kingdom of God is come in me as a person, and I have come to establish the rule and reign of, the, of, of God to bring heaven to earth and every place. The kingdom comes, that means Satan's kingdom has to go. After he stands up and he does that, after he speaks that, he goes, Luke chapter 4, 
he walks into the synagogue. And there's a man in the synagogue. In the synagogue, there's a man who is possessed or has a demon. The man, it says, has an evil spirit. And the demon cried out, and Jesus rebuked the spirit and said, Be quiet. And he commanded the demon to come out. And all the people, it says, they were amazed and said to each other, What words are these? With authority and with power, he commands unclean spirits, and they come out. Now, that word authority is excusia. It means I have the right, the legal right, and power is deutimus. I not only have the legal right, but I have the power to back it up. For example, if an enemy attacked Hawaii, United States, that may not be part of the continental United States, but is one of the states of the United States of America. Somebody attacks Hawaii. We have the legal right to go and protect that state and get that invasion out of there. And we have the power and the might to do it. That's exactly what this means. Jesus has been, had power and he had authority to cast that demon out. You move on, Luke chapter 4, still Luke, Luke chapter 4. Jesus went to Peter's, mother, Peter's mother-in-law's house. He walks in, his mother-in-law has a fever. Jesus walks over and it says, he rebuked the fever and he drove it out. Now that word rebuke is ekbalo. That word means to drive out. And it's the exact same word in the Greek Septuagint in the Old Testament translated into the Greek. That word drive out is the same word that whenever Jesus, God sent the Israelites into Canaan, he said, drive out the enemy. Ekbalo, cast it out. Get rid of it. Take over. So that word right there, ekbalo, Jesus went in and he addressed that spirit that was giving Peter's mother-in-law a fever, cast it out, and she got up. These two encounters, the man in the synagogue, Peter's mother-in-law, do you see that there's demonic activity there? Divine healing and demonic activity are intertwined. Sometimes before you can get somebody healed, you have to get them delivered. We're going to talk about that more in the future. I don't have time to get into it today. I just want to throw that out there for you to put it in your pipe and start smoking it and thinking about it. Think about it pontificate on it. Luke chapter 4, verse 40, it says, after he did these two things, in the synagogue, Peter's mother-in-law cast out those demons. It says, and when the sun was setting, all those who had any kind of sickness with various diseases were brought to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them all. And the demons also came out of many crying out, He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he rebuked them at Balo, told them to be quiet and not to speak. Then you go on, Luke chapter 6. I'm going to move real quick. We'll come back and we'll talk about some of these in weeks to come. Luke chapter 6. Jesus healed a man in the synagogue with a swivered up hand. He commanded the man to stretch forth his hand. The man responded in faith. And he stretched forth his hand, and he was healed that day. And the religious people got upset with Jesus for healing a sick man on the Sabbath day. Beloved, there are still religious people today that will get upset in a church service if Jesus shows up and starts healing and delivering people. 
That's an amen. Oh, my. Luke 6, 17. And it says, and multitude of people came to hear Jesus and be healed of their diseases. Those who were tormented with evil spirits were cured. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for power was coming out of him and he healed them all. Can you see healing and deliverance side by side continuously through the Gospels? Luke 7, 1 through 10, Jesus healed the centurion servant with a word. And then Luke 7, 21, this is again combination, deliverance and healing. He cured many of the afflictions and infirmities and evil spirits. And to many blind, he gave their sight. So he replied to the messenger. This is whenever John the Baptist sent a messenger saying, are you really the Christ? And Jesus responded, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news proclaimed to the poor. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am doing what I was sent to do. I am doing what I said I was going to do. I am healing and I am delivering those who are bound by the powers of darkness. He has the devil on the run. He's setting captives free. Then Luke 8, he went through the city and the villages preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And some women, meaning more than one, some, some women had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. One of them was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons. Healing and deliverance. Healing and deliverance. Here's healing. Woman with the issue of blood for 12 years touched him in his garment. And in the process, he went and healed, a, raised a little girl from the dead. Luke 9. He called his 12 disciples to him. And he said, I give you power. Deutimus. I give you authority. Excusia. I give you power and authority over all demons. And to cure diseases and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick are you getting the theme yet then he then it says he feeds 5,000 and he's talked to them about the kingdom of God and healed all those who needed healing on to chap chapter 9 of Luke there was a little boy who had an evil spirit he threw the little boy down in convulsions and he was tormenting him, foaming at the mouth. Jesus comes along. He casts the demon out of the little boy. And it says the people were amazed at the greatness. Beloved, I want to emphasize again to you that it's not sickness that brings God glory. It says right here in this passage that they glorified God because of Jesus, because of what he did. You're not going to find any place in the New Testament where they gave glory to God because Jesus said, I want you to be sick a little while so I can teach you a lesson. That is a, that is a demonic religious lie that has been given to the church. Do not believe that. Show me one place in the New Testament. And don't go with me with, with Paul's thorn in the flesh. I've got plenty to tell you about that. Not one place will you find that God made anybody sick and they gave glory to God because of it. Jesus came and opened prison doors, set the captive free. He destroyed the works of the devil, Luke chapter 10. He gave authority to his 72. He said to them, go heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near. And when they came back, they reported, they were thrilled and said, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus was thrilled and he said, I know, woo, I saw Satan fall like a flash of lightning. Come on, church. Is that true? And then he went on to say, I give you authority 
to trample on serpents and scorpions over all. Say all. all. That word in the Greek is pas, and it, it, it literally means all, all the power of the enemy. The devil, the enemy of God, only has power that we give him. Because Jesus took all the power, gave it to us, and the only power he has is what we relegate to him. Oh, that's true. Jesus gave us power and authority. Then he goes to the synagogue. Again, he drives a demon out of a man in the synagogue. The man is blind and he's mute. And it says he cast the demon out and the man could see and speak. So there you have the combination of the man had to be free of the demon before he could be healed in the synagogue. Are you catching this? And then the religious people got upset with Jesus and they said, oh, he's doing that because he's the son of Beelzebub. He's the prince of demons. How many churches today, if somebody is healed, they say, well, you know, that, that expecting signs and wonders and miracles, that stuff is demonic. Beloved, if God heals somebody and people jump up and down and worship the Lord because they receive their healing from God who is glorified. Jesus said, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And it is. Jesus said, if Satan drives out Satan, how could his, how could his kingdom that's divided stand? That's the, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Come on, I'm getting real raw and real with you guys today. Jesus said, but if I, but if I, with the finger of God, drive out Satan, then the kingdom of God has come among you. Now, those people that he spoke to would have known exactly what he's talking about. Because in Exodus, whenever Moses was sent in to deliver the children of Israel, and the plagues came upon the people, the first plague, the second plague, the magicians and the sorcerers, those who do black magic, they were there and they were able to, to do what Moses did, the, 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 the first two plagues. When the third plague came, they weren't able to match the power of God. And they said, it is, this is the very finger of God. So Jesus is saying, I am. I am. I am. Oh, beloved, do you get it? And then in chapter 11 of, of, of Luke, it says, when Jesus goes on to say, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his palace, his goods are at peace, but when a stronger than that one comes, he's overcome and he takes him, takes from him his armor that he trusted in, and divides his spoil. Jesus is saying to him, yeah, Satan's a strong man, all right. But there's one who has come who is stronger than that strong man. And I have come to take over. Come on, church. He came to take his armor. You know how I know that? Look at Colossians 2.15. It says, Jesus disarmed the powers and authority. And he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. Oh, I'm shaking up here, people. The glory of God. Oh, he has the keys. He has the keys. Jesus said, I give to you, my church, the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, you open those prison doors, you loose them, they'll be loosed on earth. 
Beloved, we have the power to bind the Satan. We have the power to bind the enemy. He is a defeated foe. Jesus has already conquered him. We need, to, we need to realize who we are in Christ and begin to stand up in the power and the authority that we have been given and stop cowering down. We are the victorious church and we need to live that kind of life before this world that is looking for answers. Luke chapter 13. A woman in the synagogue, he called her a daughter of Abraham. That Jesus said, Satan has bound these 18 years. And Jesus looked at her and said, woman, you are loosed of your infirmity. He cast that demon out. She stands up straight because the evil spirit's gone. Healing and deliverance, beloved. Going on in chapter 13, some Pharisees came saying to him, get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, you go tell that fox. That's, that's what it says. You go tell that fox. Behold, listen to this. I cast out demons and perform cures today, tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. What do I do? Jesus said, I cast out the devil. I heal the sick. And you wait until I come up out of the grave. I'm going to multiply myself in my church. Church, you are the ones that God destined to walk in the earth in this hour, to carry his name, Christ, Christians, the anointed ones, to walk in his power and authority and do what Jesus did. I'm just about done. The rule and reign of God has invaded the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of God has come the stronger one has come and bound the strong man. He's opened the prison door so that the captives can be set free. The inbreaking of the kingdom of God came in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what they need to say of us, church. You've seen me, you've seen Jesus. And Jesus went and did what he said he was going to do. He raised the dead, made the lame to walk, made shriveled, deformed people well again, healed leprosy, cancer. He de made deaf ears to open, blind eyes to see, called me mute tongues to speak, crippled and bent over people to be made straight. And the demons were on the run. <laughs> Almost done, Luke 15. That's where you see that. The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Three parables about something that's lost. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And remember what Jesus said, the son of God came to seek and to save that which is lost. Can you hear his heart here? So this is my point. I said all of this ran you through the whole book of Luke almost. To say this is why we exist as a church. Because this is why Jesus came. Are you ready? Are your ears open? You ready to receive? This is why Jesus came. To get lost people saved to get bound people free, and to get sick people healed. Is that true? And then train people to go do what he was doing. Is that correct? That's why Jesus came. That's what he wants of us as individuals. That's what he wants of us as a church. So church, I'm going to be emphasizing this from now on. The reason that we exist as a church, the reason that Jesus raised up what he calls the church, his body, 
The purpose that we have is not to be a country club. It's not to just come in here and have good fellowship, and I love the good fellow. I love you all. I love you all. I'm thankful for every single one of you. But he didn't raise us up to be pew potatoes. He didn't raise us up to be an audience. He raised us up to be an army. To go with the power and the authority that he did and wage war on the kingdom of hell. And he gave us a promise that he's given us power and authority and the keys and the gates of hell cannot prevail against us because we have the keys. Keys don't march. I mean, uh, gates don't march. Do you realize that Satan is not coming to hell? Kingdom of hell is not coming at us with gates. Gates are defensive. The gates of hell are protecting the people, the prisoners of war, keeping them bound. Do you see that? Jesus has said, you march against the gates of hell with the keys that I have given you and the power and authority that I have given you. You open those gates and you set the captives free. That's it, people. I'm out of breath. Hallelujah. Our purpose, get lost people saved, get bound people free, get sick people healed, and train and equip and immobilize an army to do what Jesus did. Do you believe that? Get lost people saved. Come say it with me. Get lost people saved. Get bound people set free. Get sick people healed. And train and equip an army to do what Jesus did. We're going to work on that. That's our goal. Sign up sheet. Amen. And we're going to work on that. Tell you what, church. We're going to start working on this, putting some things together. We're going to launch some things in the fall. We're going to, we're going to drill down on this. We're going to go after this. Because this is why we exist. Luke chapter 24. Luke recall, records that on the road to Emmaus, there's two couple disciples that are walking with them. Jesus broke bread with them, and it says here, then he opened their minds so they can understand the scripture. He told them all that was written. The Messiah will suffer, rise, be raised from the dead third day. Repentance, forgiveness of sins will be preached, and in his name all nations will be saved, beginning with Jerusalem. We are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. You will be clothed with power from on high. Luke, the Gentile physician who wrote the gospel, also wrote the book of Acts. And he picks right up in Acts chapter 1 with empowerment of the church to go do what Jesus did. God still heals. God still saves. God still delivers. And we have an army of people to train and equip to do what Jesus did. Amen. I'd like for you to just make this declaration with me this morning. Jesus stood up and he read out of Isaiah 61. I'm going to read it. I want you to repeat it and repeat it like you mean it, like Jesus stood up and said it on that day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. 
to take good news to the poor, to, the poor. to heal the brokenhearted, to, broken to proclaim liberty to the captives, to, the captives. to open prison doors to those who are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's his emancipation of proclamation, and beloved, that's our declaration today. There is a world that is hurting and in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in need of a people who can set them free from their demons. God wants us to walk in freedom and understand who we are so that we can take the freedom that we have out to the streets. The church has been relegated as irrelevant to meet the needs of society today. But Jesus Christ is what the world is crying for. They need what we have. How many of you love the freedom that you have in Christ? So what do we do every week? We come in here and we're so thankful for our freedom. But how often do we take that freedom that we have and we take it to the person who's with us in the office beside of us or in the grocery store when they say, I'm hurting, or you see them downcast, they're depressed? What would it take for us to go be the light in the darkness? Just do it. Just do it. When somebody's hurting, say, you know what? Daddy loves you so much. Let me pray for you. Is it okay if I pray for you? It's okay to go be love personified. It's okay to do that. It's okay to go love people. That's just what Jesus did. He was driven by compassion. He was driven by love. I'm just going to ask you from this day forward, every day when you get up, would you ask God for a fresh baptism of his love? of his compassion so that we can be driven by love to take what we have been given freely freely you have received freely give take what you've been given and go give it away amen and amen mark i didn't see you sitting there when did you come in welcome i'm glad to see you mark hegedus and his lovely wife Christy, Christy, I'm sorry, Christy. I, I can forget Bruce's name sometimes. I have to say his name over and over again, Bruce, Bruce. I'm married to Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. <laughs> Welcome, you guys. So glad you're here. So glad you're here. So what I'm going to do, because it's Father's Day, I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys uh, the permission to leave if you want to leave. But I also want people, Carol, come on up here. Come on, some of you who are intercessors, I don't, prayer people. I want you to come up here. If you want to be activated fresh and new, want a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit, maybe you know that there's some things that you're, like Julia said, I'm just not quite right and I need to get free. Maybe there's some blockages inside of you. You've got some needs and you know it. We're going to pray for you up here. We don't want you to get out of here without having some prayer. Let's activate, activate this word today. Act on the word. Act on the word. Amen. Come on, come up here, Joey. Just come up here. Anybody else? Cindy, come on. I hate to point out people just to, but I want more people up here to pray. Thank you, Julia. So, Father, I pray your blessing over every person today. I declare that the Spirit of the Lord is up on them and that they are anointed with power and authority that has been given to them in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray 
that as we begin to pursue this whole understanding that our model is Jesus and we are to look like Jesus and act like Jesus as we start delving more into the Gospels so that Jesus you you become real to us and you start standing up inside of us and we begin to be Jesus with skin on God I pray that the eyes of our spiritual understanding would be opened and that we would experientially encounter you and be filled fresh and anew with your vision, with your love, and with your purpose, individually and collectively. And Father, if anybody has a need today, we just pray in Jesus' name and declare that those needs will be met because Jesus has met every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we thank you for it. Amen and amen.